Hey, this is uh, day two or part two of the capped crash course. Uh, only two topics up here, as you can see, but this is going to fill at least the full 40-minute block. Uh, there's plenty to talk about with electricity and magnetism. Uh, you know, again, this is one of those things that they cover for a whole year in a lot of courses, and I'm going to try to fit it in 40 minutes. Uh, so, I wanted to start with the basics of magnetism, because we're going to learn that these two things are very intimately linked. You need, you, you need magnetism to produce electricity, and electricity can induce magnetism. So the basic idea behind magnetism, magnetism, the, the source of magnetism is all about un, unpaired electrons that all spin in the same direction. Uh, certain elements tend to form better magnets because they have more unpaired electrons that can kind of spin in the same direction. And the important thing to get from this is the idea of a magnetic field. A magnetic field is just the area around a magnet where that sort of magnetic influence is, is felt or sensed. Um, now your basic bar magnet, a lot of times they're kind of black and red like this. It kind of has a magnetic field around it that kind of starts up and goes like this, like that. And the idea here is if I took a magnet and actually took iron filings and sprinkled it around it, they would kind of align themselves in this way, sort of all magnetic like that. And we see the same thing with Earth, because Earth is itself a magnet. Well, it has a North Pole and a South Pole. And actually the reason for Earth's magnetic uh, field is that core that I talked about in the last video, that liquid in, uh, outer core that's constantly kind of mer mer bleh, moving around, churning, and convecting. Well, that core is mostly iron. It's iron and nickel, and there's some cobalt in there. Those are kind of the three big um, metallic el uh, uh, magnetic elements. So because those are moving around, the Earth itself actually forms uh, large magnets. So if I just want to imagine the poles here... Um, if we call that the North Pole, the uh, magnetic field around the Earth kind of skews the same way, like that. And this is actually really good to us as humans, or I should just say living things on this planet, because since this is ma uh, a sort of magnetic field, it means that anything that enters <clears throat> this magnetic field that's susceptible to magnetism is going to get slightly deflected. And one of those things is... Uh, certain rays from the sun, and more specifically, uh, cosmic type rays from far and outer space. They're going to kind of come towards the Earth, but as they hit this magnetic field, all the kind of magnetic based, uh, or, or at least I should say the, the charged uh, rays kind of skew a little bit. And the, you know, obviously a lot of them do hit the Earth, but a lot of times they skew and they miss the Earth like this. And in fact, what we call the northern lights, or aurora borealis, is actually our perception of those rays that kind of skew and bypass the Earth. And that's why you can only see the northern lights uh, up in the far north <clears throat> or in the far south. Now, that being said, there's not much land down here besides Antarctica, so we don't really refer to, to, to the southern lights very often. But you could theoretically see the same thing. Okay? So, now I'm going to talk about electricity. I haven't talked about how they're linked just yet, but I certainly will. Uh, but let me define the basics of electricity. The idea of electricity is it's the movement of charged particles all in one direction. Uh, that charged particle in 99.9% .9 of the time is going to be the electron. Now, I don't just want to say it's moving electrons. A lot of people say that as their definition, but remember, electrons are always moving. But the thing is, they're moving randomly. If they're moving randomly, it's, it's not electricity. You need the mass movement of electrons to be going in one direction in order to have electricity. Okay. Um, so electricity and magnetism are closely linked, and I have a couple little simulations to kind of help to show this. Now, here I have a magnet. And here I have a coil of wire attached to a light bulb. Now, as I move this magnet closer, watch what happens to the electrons, which these blue dots sim are symbolizing electrons. They're kind of moving a little bit. And notice the light. As this moves, it's basically shoving the electrons aside. 
And that makes sense because electrons are negatively charged. And this is a magnet which has a north and a south end. So as it moves through, it's basically going to shove these electrons to the side and it's going to cause temporary electricity. And this is a phenomenon that we can actually, uh, we see it all the time. This is kind of how electricity was discovered. So uh, I'm going to try to move this. I want the camera to focus on, yeah, right here. So this is called a galvanometer. This is a device that measures electric currents. And actually, the unit here says microamperes, and it's pointing to zero. Amperes, that's a unit of electric current. So right now, we have no electricity flowing through these wires. What I've done is I've attached these wires to this. It's called solenoid. And it's basically, imagine you, you took a copper wire and wrapped it around something like 500 times. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing that was just seen in that FET. Let me just grab a, a magnet, which I have here. This is uh, some really strong neodymium magnets. And I'm going to be moving the magnet through that coil. And you need to look at this and, and notice when we have a current flowing, which is when the needle moves. See the needle moving there? And I could flip it around. It should go the other way. Okay. So the idea is you can create electricity using just a magnet and a coil. And again, all that's really happening is by inserting the magnet, I'm just shoving those electrons down the line. And by removing the magnet, I'm shoving the electrons down the line the other way. It's all about movement. It's not just about a magnet and a coil. Because look, if I drop this in, it returns to zero and it just sits there. The key is you need some kind of movement between a magnet and a coil. Now, it could be the coil moving too. Right now, there's a magnet in there standing up. Look what happens when I move the coil we get the same thing. We get the same electricity. So the idea is you just need some kind of movement between a magnet and a coil of wire to create electricity. This phenomenon is called electromagnetic induction. Induction to induce means like to force something to do something like uh, when a doctor induces labor He basically forces it to start um, So here we have electromagnetic so a magnet will induce electricity uh, This concept also known as Faraday's law named after the uh, scientists who first kind of discovered it So that's the first way that electricity and magnetism are linked is that if you take a magnet and a coil You can induce electricity by having constant movement between uh, the magnet and the coil. Now this might not seem like a lot. I mean, who cares that we can make a little needle move on a, a device here? But this actually does relate uh, to us on the industrial scale. And I think one of these FET simulations shows this. Yeah, right here with our generator. So here we have a coil and we have a magnet. Now if this magnet were to move through there, we would generate electricity and see the light bulb light up. But it doesn't just have to move through there. All we need is some kind of relative uh, movement between the magnet and the coil. Again, it doesn't have to go through. It just needs to be near it. So what we have here is a little bit of water. And as the water spins, it turns this wheel, which now the magnet moves. And notice every time it's shoving the electrons up or down a little bit. And all you need to have electricity is movement of electrons. And we can turn that up, and you can see it can pretty much power that light full time. So this concept isn't just a, you know, a little cool trick. It's how we get our electricity. Let me see. I'm going to follow my sequence here. Okay, pretty much covered all that. So what we basically, what I just showed you down here with, with, uh, with this was a simple generator. Now, generator you probably know as like the device that you fill with gasoline and turn on when there's a power outage. But in uh, chemistry and physics, a basic generator is a device that converts uh, movement into electricity. Let me see if I can adjust that. Getting a glare. Uh, the idea behind a generator is movement into electricity. So again, I just showed you before. I took a magnet and I moved it and I created electricity. So that's a simple example of a generator. Uh, another example of a generator, let me set the computer up down here again. 
that to the side. This here is a little device we call a hand crank generator. And the idea is that when this spins, inside there is a little magnet and coil combination. So when I turn this knob, this wheel, it's basically moving a magnet uh, relative to a coil. So we should get some movement, uh, some electricity there too. So let me hook it up to this light bulb. And assuming everything is connected, we should see that light up. And there, you can see that light bulb glowing there. The harder I move it, the, the more it's going to glow. And look, I can go one way or the other. Here, I'm going backwards. Okay. So this is another example of just a generator. It's a tool that's engineered so that when I turn the coil here, uh, a magnet and a coil are, are moving um, relative to one another. Now before I leave the topic of generators, I just want to cover um, how we actually generate electricity on a large scale. Pretty much every type of power except for solar panels and uh, tidal power maybe, but that's such a tiny percentage. Pretty much every major type of power utilizes electromagnetic induction to form a generator. So. Uh, first, I just want to cover wind power. So you have a wind turbine. Okay. Now inside this tower, and again, I didn't, you know, engineer these myself, but it's some kind of system where we have a coil of wire, and we have some kind of magnet in there, and this wire goes all the way to the bottom, and then it goes out. And all you need is movement relative. Uh, the coil relative to the magnet and you get electricity. So the idea is it's engineered in such a way that when this wind turbine spins, either the coil's gonna move or perhaps the magnet's gonna move and you're just gonna get that relative motion. So again, we're using electromagnetic induction to create electricity. When this magnet's moving, it's just shoving electrons down the line and that's all we need for power. I can do the same thing with hydroelectric. Hydroelectric, I actually just showed that in the, in the uh, animation here. Hydro means water, so it's electricity from water. Now the basic idea here is, again, you have some kind of coil of wire, and you have some kind of magnet. And generally, these are set up so that the coil is going to spin around the magnet. So imagine there's some kind of wheel connecting that coil. Obviously, it looks nothing like this, but it's some sort of wheel here. And the idea is that when the wheel spins, it's going to spin that coil. So all you need to do is get water to flow past that wheel, and it's going to generate power. So you could put this, you know, in some kind of river and get a little bit of power that way. But, you know, that's not really going to power much more than maybe a light bulb. So the idea here is that you build a dam, a giant dam like a Hoover Dam, and you have an opening. And because all the water builds up behind the dam, it's going to basically blast water through that opening. So instead of a little bit of water, you're going to get just a giant jet stream of water basically shooting through there. So hydroelectric power, it's the same thing. It just comes from, uh, you know, spinning that wheel, which spins a turbine, which uh, moves relative to a magnet, produces electricity. Okay, I'm going to keep this up actually for the next one. And this is kind of a broad category that we sometimes call thermal. So we said we can get wind to spin that wheel, or we can get water to spin that wheel, or a third way is to use steam to spin that wheel. So imagine we have some kind of pipe here, okay, and that pipe's going to kind of loop around, and obviously it's much more complex than the way I'm drawing it, I realize this, but something along the lines of this, where what we have is water throughout this system. Say we have water over here, okay, and we're going to heat that water up somehow. So again, we just take something flammable and we apply the heat down here. And that heat, when it contacts the water, it's going to boil that water, turn the water into steam. And that steam is going to rise and basically shoot through this pipe like this. And as it moves past, it's going to manage to spin that wheel, spin that turbine. Okay? Now, as it moves past, it generally is going to lose its heat and cool back down into water 
to replenish the cycle. So the only thing you need to keep this going is a constant supply of heat to boil that water. So what are the things that we use to keep that fire burning? Well, coal. Coal power plant. It's basically, you just keep shoveling coal in here, keep that fire going, keep that steam moving. Same thing with natural gas. Same thing with oil. Now, oil's not really used that often to generate electricity because it's much more effective uh, being refined into gasoline or jet fuel or home heating oil. Uh, but coal, oil, natural gas, we use trash for this. If you ever drive past uh, 95 in Bridgeport, the big power plant you see right on the water, that's a trash to energy power plant. So they just throw trash in here and they incinerate it. And that heat from burning trash will boil this water and make it go past the uh, turbine generating power. Um, another one here is nuclear. Now nuclear, you take some kind of nuclear fuel, most commonly is uranium. And if you kind of enrich that uranium enough, uh, it becomes very highly radioactive, and radioactive materials just give off a lot of energy in the form of gamma rays. So in that case, they don't actually have any kind of fire. They just have more water, and they just put a uranium rod in here, and just by being so, by existing so radioactive, it shoots off so much energy that it's going to boil that steam or uh, boil that water into steam. So all of these are considered thermal, but really, you know, even though they're so vastly different, they all generate electricity the same way, using electromagnetic induction. All you need to do is move a coil and a magnet, and you're gonna generate that electricity. The only common way we generate electricity that doesn't use this kind of system is solar panels, which just convert electricity directly from sunlight into electricity. Okay. All right, another way electricity and magnetism are closely linked is that if I have a wire, let's say that's a copper wire. Copper itself is not magnetic. It's not a magnet. It's not going to stick to anything. But if I have an electric current running through this wire, If there's a current running through that wire, all of a sudden, the wire turns into a magnet. It's this concept called an electromagnet, something that when electricity is moving through it, it turns into a magnet. And actually, this is pretty clear uh, if we look at some of these simulations here, like this one. When I move this, notice the electrons are moving inside. And once you have moving electrons, that's all you need to generate uh, some sort of magnetism. Now, a single wire like this, with a flow of electrons moving through it, is magnetic. But it's so weakly magnetic that you're not really going to get any kind of real action out of that. But the idea is, if you coil that around <clears throat> in the same direction, the electrons are all going to kind of flow in that same direction, and they'll kind of project their magnetic field in the same direction, and it kind of builds up. So that's why I used this tool before. This solenoid is basically a whole bunch of copper wire coiled together uh, so that when you move a magnet through there, it generates electricity. Or if I run electricity through this, it acts as a magnet. Now I can actually demonstrate this concept. Let me move the camera again. So what I'm trying to show here is this compass needle. Now the way a compass works is the needle is a very lightweight magnet floating on water, so it's very, you know, there's not a lot of friction in there, and it naturally points north. Okay, so if I move this, what I have here is I just wrapped a bunch of uh, copper wire around the, the compass, and if I just kind of set this like this, and if I hook up two ends to my generator, hopefully get it to not move so much. I can hopefully demonstrate this phenomenon. Okay, so hopefully you'll notice that when I turn this, you'll see the compass needle move. Here we go. Okay, a little hard to see. I'm going to do it again, and it goes back. So really, what you're seeing is that when I turn this coil or the the handle of this generator, 
the wire that's wrapped around that compass becomes magnetic. And because it's magnetic, it's going to repel the magnet that's very close to it underneath. And this concept goes beyond just moving compass needles. What I basically demonstrated with that is the world's simplest motor. Now, I talked about a generator before. I said a generator is a device that converts motion into electricity. What a motor is, is a device that converts electricity into movement. So a motor is how we, as a society, actually benefit uh, from electricity. Now, motors and generators are very closely linked. Notice a motor is electricity to movement. A generator is movement to electricity. So I can actually take this generator and turn it into a motor by using a source of electricity, which in this case is a battery. Now, a battery is just... Uh, it stores electric charge through a chemical reaction. So if I touch one end of this to the bottom and the other end to the top, I can get movement there. Okay? So again, this is a generator. When I turn the handle, it generates electricity. But if I switch it around and hook it up to a source of uh, power, it turns into a motor. So that's the basic idea behind motors and generators. Okay? No, 21 minutes in. All right, making good time here. We're now going to talk about, we, we've covered very basically the, the basics of electricity and magnetism. And now we're going to talk about how we actually utilize it in circuits. So the first thing we should know is how a battery works. I went over it very briefly, but let me go into a little bit more detail. And this is even going to be simplified very much. Uh, the idea behind a battery is that we have a chemical reaction happening inside here. Now that chemical reaction in different batteries have different chemicals, um, but it basically produces a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. Now electrons are negatively charged. They want to move towards something that's positively charged. Uh, but there's some sort of barrier in the middle. Again, this is extremely simplified there's a barrier in the middle that the electrons can't pass through. So imagine we have a whole bunch of electrons that generally want to start at this end, the negative end, and we have some sort of big positive force over here that's caused by the chemical reaction. So they want to get over here, but they can't. They can't pass right through the middle. So right now, I have a whole bunch of unhappy electrons. Until you hook up some sort of wire or some sort of device that links from one end to the other. And in fact, if I just grab a simple alligator clip, which is just basically a glorified wire, just by going like this, by touching the two ends, I've created a complete circuit. So here we have electrons moving through the wire. And I kind of defined that, or I stated that word circuit, which we're going to kind of work with from here. So that's how a battery works. I'm going to go over now how a light bulb works, because most of the circuits you're going to learn about involve batteries and light bulbs. Okay? So a light bulb, and again, this is kind of an incandescent light bulb. It's kind of uh, outdated. You probably can't buy these very much, very easily anymore. Most new light bulbs are uh, compact fluorescents, which don't quite work like this. The idea is, in a light bulb, there are two contact points, the bottom and anywhere on this side. And you have to touch both of them at the same time with the electric current in order to get it to light up. So what happens is current enters one contact point, let's call this the side, and the electric current's gonna go up through this wire and across that wire and back down and out. And there's a couple key points we have to note here. Because if it just did if it was just a wire that did this, it wouldn't light up at all. So the first thing you have to note is this part up here. Let me get the color ready. This part up here is called the filament. Now a filament is a special piece of wire made out of a different material and the purpose of a filament is that it has a lot of resistance. A lot of resistance to the flow of those electrons, to the flow of this electricity. Now it's not an insulator. An insulator is something that electrons can't flow through. 
but it puts up enough of a fight that the electrons have to really push hard to get through that. And in pushing hard to get through that, they give off a lot of energy. That energy takes the form of heat and light. The analogy I sometimes use is, uh, imagine you're driving down a nice, clean, freshly paved road, and then all of a sudden, right in the middle, there's like a patch of gravel. And your car is like nice and smooth and quiet, and then all of a sudden, it's like brrrr on that patch of gravel. Well, your car is going to kind of heat up a little bit from that. And that's kind of the idea of a filament. Or you could also sometimes think of it like, imagine you're trying to walk down the hallway, and like the football team's in the middle of the hallway, and they're trying to stop everyone from getting through. Now, if you push hard, you will eventually make it through. But you're going to be like hot and like panting by the time you get through, and you will have given off a lot of energy to get through. That's the idea behind a filament. It resists the flow of electrons enough to make them really work hard to get through, and therefore they give off a lot of heat and light. In fact, it's so much heat that filaments are generally made of tungsten, which has one of the highest melting points out of any metal, because this can kind of burn as hot as 2,500 degrees Celsius. So that explains a wire, but it doesn't actually explain the bulb yet. So the purpose behind the bulb is that if I had this tungsten exposed to natural air and it was burning at 2,500 degrees, well, anything that burns that hot is going to just react with the air around it, whether it's the oxygen or the nitrogen. More realis realistically is the oxygen. So the purpose of a bulb is to stop oxygen from hitting this incredibly hot flame. Well, it's not a flame, but this incredibly hot piece of metal. And to do that, they suck out all the air and they replace it with argon, which as we know from chemistry is a noble gas. It has eight valence electrons and it's done. You can heat argon up as hot as you want it to be and it's not going to bond to anything. So the purpose of the bulb is to keep the, the noble gas in place so that no oxygen touches this hot um, piece of metal. And if it did, in fact, like if, if this cracked open, you would have O2 gas that would fly in it would touch this really hot filament and it would bond to it and it would form some kind of tungsten oxide. And some kind of tungsten oxide is not going to carry the current like pure tungsten would and that's why it would kind of burn out. So that's the basics of how a light bulb works. At this point I'm going to go over uh, some basics of uh, a circuit. Okay? Now, a circuit is a term you've probably heard. But a circuit basically consists of a voltage source, a conductor, and a load. Now a load is just the device that you're trying to power up. Most commonly it's a light bulb. The conductor is the material that conducts the current that allows the electrons to flow. So that's generally going to be your wire. And the voltage source is like the power source. So imagine we have a wire like this, and I can even say let's hook it up to a batter, uh, bulb, something like that. So in order to light this up, I need electrons to flow through it. And right now, in this wire, I have electrons moving around. They're moving around like crazy, but it's random movement. You need movement in one solid direction in order to light that light bulb up. What a voltage source does is it it provides a positive force on one side and a negative force on the other that's going to give those electrons a reason to move. So generally there are two common sources of voltage. One is some sort of generator that utilizes uh, electromagnetic induction and the other is just a battery. So again I explained how a battery works. It produces through a chemical reaction a positive charge on one side and a negative on the other. And remember electrons can't pass right in the middle of the battery. So this now gives electrons a reason to move. The electrons generally travel from the negative side. Now they're going to go through the bulb and into the positive side. So voltage itself is kind of like a difference in electrical potential. I have a plus and a minus. It's the reason electrons move. And this is a basic circuit. You have your voltage source, you have your conductor, and you have your load. So when it comes to current uh, circuits, there's three kind of quantities that we can know. Quant we can quantify circuits. And the first one is what I just talked about, voltage. Once again, voltage is the reason the electrons move in a circuit. Uh, 
it's a difference in electrical potential, or another way of saying it, it's like a big plus on one side and a big minus on the other. Without voltage, the current has no reason to move. So, voltage, uh, the unit of voltage is volts. And the symbol for volts are V. And the symbol for voltage itself is V. You know, sort of like how in gas laws, pressure is P, and the unit of pressure could be like Pascal's PA. Well, voltage is V, volts is also V. The next concept we need to know is current. Current is a measure of how much actually, how much electricity is actually flowing through a wire. Or it's like how many electrons are physically moving through a wire. When there's a lot of electricity flowing, it's a lot of current. Now, the symbol for current is I. I believe it stems from intensity, something like that. And the unit of current is amps. Or more specifically, it's amperes but we commonly call that amps. And the unit uh, for that is A, or the symbol for that is A. The last thing we need to know, and this is again something I have mentioned, is resistance. Resistance, I really can't think of a better way of describing it without the word resistance, is just how much the circuit resists the flow of electrons. If you have something like just a wire touching these two, wire from one end to the other, a wire has very low resistance. A wire is a very good conductor. But if I hold this battery like this in my fingers, well, technically, I am connecting the positive to the negative end. But is electricity flowing? Not really, because my body offers a lot of resistance through my fingers. Or even if I go like this, I'm now creating another loop where the electricity is trying to flow from the negative end of the battery through my body, right through my torso, and back into the battery, and I'm offering a lot of resistance. Resistance, symbol of R, and the unit for resistance is ohms. Ohms, and the symbol for that is the Greek letter omega. So you might see this when it comes to electrical devices. Uh, ohms is how much resistance. So a wire is going to have very low resistance, very few ohms, and the human body has very high ohms. I think they generally say um, regular human tissue is like 100,000 ohms, but if your skin like gets wet and if you have like an open cut, you drop down to like 500 ohms. Now, these three are related in something called Ohm's Law. So I like to refer to Ohm's Law in terms of the current. Because it's basically three letters that you can rearrange, sort of like that density formula, D equals M over V. You know, you could switch it around and say uh, M equals DV or V equals D over M or whichever way it is. Anyway, we're, Ohm's law is going to relate voltage, current, and resistance. And don't forget, voltage, current, resistance. So, I want to put this in terms of current. So it's either going to be V over R, V times R, or R over V. Now to think about this, voltage is the amount, it's like, it's the force that makes electrons move. It's the size of the plus on one side and the size of the minus on the other. If you have a lot of voltage, you're giving the electrons a good reason to move. This is a 1.5 volt battery. If I have a 9 volt battery, I'm giving the electrons a lot more of a reason to move. So with voltage, the higher the voltage, the more current you're going to get. So voltage is going to be my numerator. When it comes to resistance, the more resistance something offers, the harder it is for the electrons to move. So resistance is going to be your denominator. Okay? Ohm's law is generally written as V equals IR. Voltage is current times resistance. But I prefer to write it as I equals V over R because this makes a little more sense in my mind. The amount of current you get is dependent on the amount of voltage you get, and the more the merrier in this case, higher voltage, higher current, divided by your resistance. And for resistance, the less resistance, the higher your current is going to be. Last thing I need to talk about for uh, electricity is the basics of circuits. Now to do this, 
Well, I'll define the two types of circuits, and then we'll do some examples. There's two main categories. There's series, and there's parallel. When something is hooked up in series, the idea here is one path. One path out of the battery through every device, or every load, I should say, and then back to the end. It's one continuous path. With a parallel circuit, you give options. You give multiple paths for the electrons to take. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of these. So I have another one of these where I can actually make some circuits. All right, so here's a wire. So the first thing I need is my voltage source, so I'll use a battery. Here's my light bulb, and notice there's two contact points here. There's a bottom and the side. You have to touch both of those to make it work. So let's say I want to hook up two batteries, uh, sorry, two bulbs in series. I want one continuous path. So here's my second bulb. I'm going to go into the first bulb, out of the first bulb, straight into the second bulb, out of the second bulb, and straight back to the battery, and this gets our circuit lit. Notice the blue dots are moving. Well, that's because electrons are moving. I have now given them a path to get from one end of the battery to the other. What I can do is add a third to this. Now, try to remember how bright this is, because this matters. Look at the brightness of the bulbs. And now I'm going to add a third bulb to this. And what you hopefully notice is that they are all dimmer. They burn less bright now. And that's because in a series circuit, all of the voltage from this battery has to get shared. So if I have one bulb, that's getting nine volts. Remember, volts is like how, how strong of a force you feel on, on either side, the reason the electrons move. If I do two bulbs, well, now it's split in half, so it's 4.5 and 4.5. And with three, it's chopped in thirds. So each of these bulbs is receiving three volts of voltage, which is why the electrons are now moving slower. We have less current. Another sort of, so that's sort of a downside to a series circuit is that every time you add a new load to it, uh, it reduces the voltage and it, you get dimmer bulbs. Um, another disadvantage is that if one of these were to break like that, Notice that the other bulbs go out as well. Now, more realistically, what's going to happen is one of your filaments is going to burn out and fall. So if a filament were to fall out of this one, it's going to stop the circuit and none of them are going to work. So that's a series circuit. It's one continuous path. Let me now show a parallel circuit. Now, in a parallel circuit, you offer choices to the, light, to, to the electrons of which way they want to go. Let me hook up two of these for now. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to give the electrons a choice. They can either continue going this way, come on, or they can go up that way. Now, look, electrons obviously don't have a choice, but by offering physical paths for them to take, they're eventually going to even themselves out and go both paths. Now, from here, I'm going to go into bulb two. I'm going to come out of bulb two. And I'm going to connect back. Now, this should get me one of them lit up. And now I'm going to finish the second path. It's just going to go like that. Now this is a parallel circuit. The electrons have a choice now. And what you hopefully notice is that these are both glowing very bright. Now in fact, I can just keep adding more bulbs in parallel and the brightness should stay the same. Let me hook this one up and you'll hopefully see that. Now as soon as I connect this wire, check the brightness of the bulb, see if it changes. And it didn't. We have the same exact brightness. So you would say, well, why would anyone want a series circuit? Well, what's happening is because they're each drawing the original voltage out of the battery, this battery is basically getting drained three times faster. 
Now it makes sense for your homes to be set up in parallel like this because if it were in series, you know, every time you like plug your cell phone charger in, the lights would get dimmer and your refrigerator would, you know, get warmer basically and your TV would get less. Uh, so your house is obviously set up in parallel like this. So every time you plug something else in or turn your TV or your computer on, you're just adding another sort of load and watch the speed of this even faster. So you're just drawing more power out of that power source. All right, so that's basically it. I know that's a lot of information. Hopefully you know a little bit more about electricity than you did then. Keep in mind, the CAPT is not really going to ask you all these real specific details. It's just going to ask you reasoning type questions about this. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of background information that you need.